Welcome to the Beyond Physio podcast. I'm Dr. Jerry Yu, uh, owner of Next Level Physio. On my show today, I have Dr. Tom Buckheit, who is the director of the Regenerative Pain Therapies Program at Duke University. He has a clinical focus in and research focus for the past two decades on immune and molecular mechanisms that promote cellular resilience and recovery in conditions including neuropathy and arthritis. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for having me and a delight to be here. So much. Welcome to the Beyond Physio podcast, where we help you move, excel, and inspire others on your journey to your next level with knowledge and advice from experts and testimonials from our like-minded community. So let's get into regenerative therapies because I think there's a lot of terminology floating out there. And being that you are the director of the regenerative pain therapies at uh, Duke, let's dive into what that actually means. I think it's a great place to start. There are There's a wide spectrum of regenerative therapies, and you can really conceptualize these all the way from dry needling that you do. I think I would yeah. consider, many people consider that a regenerative therapy, and I'll explain yeah. why, mm-hmm. to platelet-rich plasma, to stem cells, to autologous condition serum. Um, and, and these are all ways, really, of just promoting tissue response and tissue healing, I think is the best yeah. way to conceptualize it. And then if that response function usually improves, and that's kind of, you know, I think, what all of our collective goals is to improve function, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I actually like to conceptualize regenerative therapies um, within the healing cascade. I think it's a much, a, a much more understandable concept that way. So if you think about it, when you have... You know, a lot of, I think a lot of your listeners have probably had an ankle sprain oh, or yeah. a minor injury before, and I think I've had a couple of significant ones as well. And mm-hmm. there's a fairly patterned response our bodies have learned to do, right? So you, you, you tear a ligament, if, for instance, in an ankle sprain, you have bleeding at the site. Um, that bleeding releases platelets, and platelets do help clot and help to stop the bleeding, but they also release a lot of growth factors. They also release some really interesting... Um, chemical attractants for other kinds of white cells. And that first set of white cells are neutrophils. Uh, they're kind of the first responders of white cells. And then there, there's a next uh, wave of white cells that come in called macrophages. And that's actually a really important part of this process. Macrophages start out very inflammatory. They actually consume and eat up the first wave of white blood cells. But if all goes as planned, those macrophages flip a switch and they become anabolic. They, they resolve inflammation, um, and they start the building process to be able to rebuild mm. a ligament that's been damaged or a tendon that's been damaged. And so I think if, you, if we all conceptualize the regenerative therapies as part of that spectrum, it's much easier. So, for instance, if you take dry needling, what you're doing with that is you are uh, starting that healing process. You're creating micro-injury mm. to start that, the body's natural healing process. Um, if you look at platelet-rich plasma, that's a concentration of platelets and, more importantly, the growth factors that start the process. Even if you look at stem cells, you know, people have uh, conceptualized stem cells in various ways, and I think they're a little bit misunderstood in a lot of ways, too. Uh, people think of, uh, for instance, a stem cell injection of taking bone marrow out or fat out and injecting into a knee or a joint. And a lot of people think that it replaces cartilage cells, replaces other cells. But a lot of what it's actually doing is starting this immune cascade. Hmm. A lot of times when most of those cells that are injected have a very short life within, for instance, a knee after injection, but they turn on that macrophage and they turn on this immune process. And so really stem cells, the way we use them in the United States, are very much just part of that healing cascade, just mm-hmm. like a PRP is or, or a dry needling is. That's really fascinating. I wonder then, um, there's been so much controversy over using stem cells. I don't know if that's still the case these days, Tom? Or uh, Yeah, I think it, well, it is controversial. And I think, um, I think one of the challenges and one of the things I've been trying to do is explain these in a way people understand. And so we can use these therapies uh, conscientiously yes. and, and appropriately. And that's one of the things that I've been had the, really the fortunate opportunity to work with some really, um, really smart basic scientists and scientists at uh, Duke CTPM, which is the Center for Translational Pain Medicine. Mm. 
uh, working with the folks like Dr. Rurangji, who's a really a great, great scientist over there, mm-hmm. and clinicians like uh, Peter Whe- Dr. Peter Whaling in mm-hmm. Germany, who's a close collaborator as well. And one of the things we've been trying to do is to look at the mechanisms of you take a therapy and you find out, first of all, uh, what are the mechanisms and, and how does it work and then and what it kind of tees it apart so you can perhaps make it better. Mm-hmm. The uh, PRP is, and stem cells have both gotten a lot of press recently, especially with some rather large negative trials mm-hmm. um, in JAMA, so the General Medical, yeah. American Medical Association, a couple of large negative trials for PRP recently that made people, I think, wake up a little bit mm-hmm. and realize that these therapies are not panaceas. Yes. Um, and... And just because it comes from blood or bone marrow doesn't mean it's going to help. You have to figure out, you know, really look at what's in that, yeah. uh, in that, and make sure it's a, uh, what you're injecting or what you're using is appropriate, and um, and and the application is appropriate too. Right. You know, it's funny you say that because um, even with all the regenerative therapies that we have, whether it be dry needling, whether it be using the shockwave um, or BFR for that matter, um, or even things like cupping, what we often tell patients is that listen, um, this is one piece of the pie, and we are going to treat those symptoms as, as we can with these regenerative therapies, but if we don't figure out the root cause as to why your movement is problematic in the first place, we're just putting a Band-Aid ourselves. It's no better right. than that. Um, a lot of people come in and say, well, I've tried Shockwave. It didn't help. Well, did they find out why you had the tennis elbow in the first place? No. Well, that's that's probably, well, let's start right there first, right. and then let's right. dive into it. And I think those mechanics are really important. You know, I, I've been... You know, practicing for you know since the since the late nineties, yeah. I think I've grown increasingly a fan of the physical modalities, and increasingly a critic of some of the medications that people have used, mm-hmm. and that frankly I've used, and I think there are significant limitations. But I think there's nothing that beats a good look at, at mechanics, and and then using, as you pointed out, using those therapies within the context of mechanics, because you're right, because if you're not changing uh, your, your, the kinetics of how you're moving, right. if those are still off, mm-hmm. you, you can do all, all kinds of things and they're not going to get better. Absolutely. Um, it's funny. Uh, I remember you getting quoted actually in the New York times about the NSAIDs talking about that. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I think I, I have, I, I share caution with mm-hmm. people about NSAIDs and about repeated steroid injections. I think they all can have a role, but I see a lot of people who are on, chronic NSAIDs. And I, the challenge is, is that that immune cascade, that healing cascade that that we just talked about that you use daily um, to engage patients and, and their own improvement, and that I, I try to use as well, you shut some of those systems off with chronic NSAIDs. Mm-hmm. And there's some decent data to that. There's some good, there's a, a really important paper that came out uh, this past year, looking at NSAIDs and its effect on acute back pain with mechanistic looks. And it, it turns out that the NSAIDs may interfere with that neutrophil I mentioned, that mm-hmm. initial white blood cell that comes in. Yeah. It may interfere with that initial step. And so you've kind of short-sheeted mm-hmm. that, that healing cascade. Do you think then it's not actually, and from your experience then, and based on the science, would it not be then a good idea for people once they had, let's just say they, for some rolled their ankle and they got a sprain, would it not be a good idea for them to be taking incest from the get-go then? I think that is a great question that we don't know yet. My personal opinion is, is that uh, or is, that it's probably okay to take a few days of an NSAID, but taking NSAIDs for three weeks to a couple months after an ankle sprain or, or a meniscus injury or something else, I think is probably not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, now, the, if you can't walk because... <laughs> You're in too much pain, right? You know, lack of mobility is, is another problem. So if it helps you move more, like everything else, right? If it helps you move more, it's probably a good idea, right? But if you can move without it, it's probably better to let your immune system just just run, yeah. Um, because then you can really engage that that switch flip, and that anabolic side of the white cells that that start the process. That's amazing. Um, tell me more about the translational pain medicine. What does that actually mean? It really is just a focus on on taking um, you know, therapies. It was actually reverse translational, translational. And actually, my interest is almost reverse. And that means you take a therapy that you know works clinically, and then you try to dissect out why is it working so that you can figure out how to optimize it for folks. Um, there's actually a nice example that we published this past year on autologous condition serum 
Uh, it's a therapy that I mentioned, mm -hmm. Dr. Whaling in Germany has been used for, for decades and he has all kinds of, you know, professional athletes that fly to Germany for treatment. So it's a therapy that works. And we looked at it in lab and said, well, how does it do what it's doing? Mm -hmm. And so I worked with uh, Dr. Rurangji and some others and, we, and set up some animal work to find out, yes, it does, in fact, reverse neuropathy symptoms and improve nerve function in, an, in a neuropathy oh. model. But how does it do it? A lot of people always thought it was these anti-inflammatory proteins uh, in it. But it turns out that a lot of those proteins just act for a short period of time. Hmm. And it didn't give the lasting relief that we see in patients. And also, frankly, we saw in these animal models in the lab, too. So something was making it last longer. Um, so we did some experiments and found out, actually, uh, some of the parts that are driving it are really exosomes, the microvesicles and exosomes, which are these instructional packets that cells hmm. share between each other i see um and so it was that that to me is the translational process which is uh taking a therapy and then asking how and why does it work and, ah, and dissecting it out so. i like that so then tell me uh dr tom if i have a patient who's um coming to us for rehab and maybe they've had a meniscus tear um, when would be the best time, in your opinion, to send them in for PRP or even consider stem cell uh, injections? Um, is it based on chronicity, based on stage of healing? I, I think first you let your body do the work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody should you know, engage deeply within physical therapy, with conditioning and strengthening. Um, I've had these experiences myself, mm -hmm. and I, I think I would encourage other folks to do what I've done in the past when I've had my various uh, various sports injuries. And I think we've all had, right? <laughs> oh, if, you yeah, play, sure. if you play sports long enough, you you, you, have you experience some of those <laughs> yeah. some of those times. Um, I, to me, I, I look at uh, an injury when it stops improving, mm -hmm. um, and I think you know again if you think of the these therapies as immune stimulants. And as healing stimulants, that's when you see. So if you get to an asymptote, if you get to a point where you just stop improving, that's when I think it's really helpful to mm -hmm. add in something that's going to restart, rekindle that fire right. of, of healing. Got it. So here's a question. Um, from what my understanding of this, and please tell me if I'm wrong, when you hit the chronic stage of pain and, and does become persistent, it's almost as if your brain has decided that, you know what? You know, Tom, you're not bleeding to death. You're okay. You're you're walking. Whatever. We're going to leave that alone because we have other things to attend to. And by adding these regenerative therapies, we can actually jumpstart that, like you said, rekindle that fire. Is that about what you would say from your point of view in pain medicine? I, I think so. I mean, so, so the part of this is is promoting healing. And even if you look at osteoarthritis, I think the best conceptual way to think about that is is almost a wound that's not healing. Mm -hmm. It's not a wear and tear. It's not a chronic inflammatory process. You know, people have tried all kinds of chronic and uh, you know drugs that right. fight inflammation that don't work for it. Uh, but if we treat it as a wound that's kind of slow to heal, then we can make it better. So that's part of it. And you're also talking about the neurologic part, right? Mm -hmm. Nerve sensitization, all the way from a peripheral nerve to the spinal cord to the brain. Yeah. That's learning, right? And we can learn. We can learn to kick a soccer ball. We can learn to play a, a piece in the piano. We can unfortunately learn pain as well. It's those those circuits and those neural synapses are strengthened, and so we have to kind of really unlearn pain in a lot of ways. And sure. and I think the best way of unlearning that also tends to be fairly mechanical. I think it's I think it's one of the stronger ways of doing it. Yeah, for sure. I know that, um, especially for conditions like fibromyalgia or other chronic pain conditions um, from my understanding from neuroscience is that we kind of have to engage with the client to let them know that listen um, every diagnostic test has said that you're okay uh, there's no quote-unquote damage per se uh, we have to actually literally work through this pain and it's probably one of the few times in rehab where we actually have to uh, basically pain is gain and say listen it's gonna hurt and just let them sort of like pre-frame that when we work with them and have them work through that process so they can actually start to uh, extinguish that circuit, if you will, from the brain down to that area of pain. Yeah. Well, I think acute pain sometimes is gain. Yeah. And if you think about it, when you, you know, when we go for a workout, if we, you know, if you or I go for a, a, a hard bike ride yeah. or, or a run, you're going to experience some, we'll experience some soreness that day, the oh, next yeah. day, especially if it's a hard workout. Um, what is that soreness? Well, it's like people call it DOMS, right? Delayed onset muscle soreness. Yeah. But really what it is, is it's a, it's an a upregulation of some of these inflammatory pathways that then turn on a healing cascade. Yeah. 
That's absolutely true. If you true. take a muscle biopsy of your thigh after a good workout, you're going to see all kinds of inflammatory stuff in there. IL-6 and all everything else jumps up almost 100-fold. <laughs> right. Uh, but that's a good inflammation. So I, th- I think the important part I always think of is it's really important to distinguish uh, acute inflammation and acute changes from chronic changes. Absolutely, yeah. That's great. Um, as far as um, your background, let's go back into what got you to this place, Dr. Tom. It's it's a bit of a circuitous uh, route that I think I took here. Um, so I had spent uh, uh, about 10 years. I was actually at Duke for about three years, and mm-hmm. then I spent about 10 years in a private practice doing a lot of spine work. Uh. I returned to Duke in 2010 uh, with an interest in peripheral nerve injury and looking at what drove pain and peripheral nerve injury. And and then I started to realize really what uh, my interest was were not factors that drove pain, but factors that were of resiliency, of how do you, like why do some people, why do half people have the same in nerve injury, half resolve and half don't? Yeah. And um, so we started working on that. We had a couple of research projects. Uh, we had collaborators. I, I was uh, working with Duke, and I was actually at Duke and the VA both. And then we had some collaborators at Walter Reed, so we looked at some nerve injury work. And then I started uh, working. Um, actually, I had a mentor. Uh, who introduced me to, to Peter Whaling in Germany, and he was looking at some of the same factors from an orthopedic standpoint. And that's just been a really nice collaboration. That's been about the past seven or eight years looking mm-hmm. at those uh, basically factors of healing and resiliency, both from a neurologic perspective and from an, or a kind of a, a joint, tendon, and muscle perspective. That's great. Um, in that time frame, um, did you find that uh, certain kinds of either movement-based therapies or anything like that were particularly helpful in, in developing that resilience? Uh, all of them, <laughs> I think, is <laughs> the right. answer. Yeah. You know, I think I, I try to keep up with the physical therapy literature as much as I can. Um, and it, it seems like that there are very clear benefits uh, of all the, you know, resi- not just endurance exercise, but resistance exercise. Sure, and, yeah. and, and it also seems like, you know, adding strength work to zone two work and to high intensity work, there's uh, probably benefits to all three of them at different times. Uh, I would probably so. defer more to your expertise <laughs> than, that, than my expertise. Yeah. So. I mean, we have definitely found that. Uh, I mean, one of the first things I tell clients when they come in, Tom, is listen, um, you've had this issue for a while. Um, we're going to rekindle things, as you, as you put it. And then from there, we're going to go through phases where it's going to not feel comfortable at first, but as we develop uh, your movement patterns to get reset, and as we start to introduce new kinds of habits into the way that you move, whether you're a runner, swimmer, biker, um, if you're a lifter even, uh, to make sure that you are set up for success to get back to the things that you want to do. And it's during that period, we call it our phase three or our inspire phase, where we then do a test retest. Go try the thing that you love to do. Let's see what your tolerance is. Let's create boundaries for us as far as, well, if I can do 10 minutes of activity now without pain, great. But when I go to 15, it becomes painful again. Okay, we'll back down from there. We'll start doing some things to build up that tolerance again. And we keep pushing that range until we get to the point where they can do their things with um, little, uh, very little pain at that point. I do the same thing with people, and I, I tell them, you know, everybody starts at a different point, yeah. and, and maybe it's someone who is running half marathons, maybe it's someone who can't walk to the mailbox. It doesn't matter in some ways. You just have to figure out where you are, and I would have them record it. I say, you know, record how far you're walking, yeah. either by time or by distance, and you're going to push yourself just a little bit each time and see if you can push that number up. And, you know, I feel like we're making progress if that number is improving, whatever that goal is for yeah. that person. And if we're not making progress, then we then we reassess what we're doing. Yeah. For yourself, Tom, what was the worst injury you ever had and what happened there? <laughs> I've had a couple of meniscus tears. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And those were always fun. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. From running and stuff or from biking? Or? Uh, one from basketball oh. and one from a, a trail run that went, uh, went, went, went awry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Now, for yourself, did you um, incorporate the use of the orthobiologics like PRP or stem cell to hasten things or well no the first one was a, a quite a while ago and then the uh, the repeat one was more recent so i just i, I did the theory of no anti-inflammatories oh um and just rehabbed it uh, as best i could mm-hmm. and uh and i have to say it it it, it hurt a bit it hurt a bit hurt <laughs> yeah. a bit for a while but uh i'm back to most most function now so that's awesome yeah when you have um what are the types of clients that you actually see coming in tom yeah, a little bit of everybody, mm-hmm. you know, um, I, I probably, one of the more common 
folks that I uh, clients I see are the you know folks who are who have have had prior injuries earlier in life. You know, we, you know people who have played sports and they're trying to reengage in sport mm-hmm. or trying to reengage in life and they're trying to get back to whatever it is. Maybe it's pickleball. Maybe it's jogging. Maybe it's you know. Um, just trying to get around town with their grandkids, you mm. know, that, that, whole, that whole spectrum. Yeah. And that, that's kind of the spectrum of the folks I look at. Um, and also those are the ones that, especially with post-traumatic arthritis, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of folks that have, have that, and they're trying to avoid or delay a joint replacement surgery. Mm. And we know that's a wonderful tool that can be used, but it's probably not a great tool if you're 45 years old and you're active. Yeah, for sure. Because you're going to wear it out, and we all know that uh, a revision of that surgery is yeah. is, is not, not an ideal situation. Yeah. So. <laughs> How do, um, would you say that age, and my guess would be yes, but would you say that age also makes a difference on how well people respond to PRP stem cells? That, that really is a huge area of investigation. I think it's a really important area. You know, people have talked about how as we age from newborn up, we start to lose activity yeah. of stem cells um, and growth factors in PRP. Right. But it still looks like a lot of these activities and a lot of these a lot of these interventions still do work. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the one of the ACS or Orgenekine studies looked at that uh, and looked at um, subsets of folks who had more advanced arthritis versus not, and they still had some response to it. So, oh. um, so I think our body still can respond. There's a, there's a question of do certain people um, need a greater uh, boost, for instance? And right. I, I typically, when I draw blood from someone, so most of the therapies I do are either PRP or autologous condition serum. Mm-hmm. And and I actually have people usually go for a, a light, uh, brisk walk, like a zone two, a little bit of exercise beforehand. Oh. Um, my feeling is, and we're trying to figure out a way to test this, yeah. which is that you're probably starting those that anabolic process off a little bit even before you draw blood. Oh, that's really uh, fascinating. But we're working yeah. on a way to test that for more formally. We haven't done that yet. Right. <laughs> so, Tom, as far as, like, things that people can do on a day-to-day basis, if we're on the topic of regenerative therapies, are there any kinds of either um, nutritional sort of uh, recommendations or even supplements that you think might even enhance the use of things like PRP or stem cells? Um I think also the question would be what enhances just general mm. health, right? Right. I think that the, the data are extremely clear that a good Mediterranean diet is the first, second, third thing ever we should all be doing. Mm. Um, I think a daily exercise, at least a lower intensity exercise is great and higher intensity if you, if people can tolerate it yeah. intermittently, but not a high intensity every single day. Mm-hmm. You know, if we think about the recovery and, and the anabolic phase that we were talking about, it's the, it's the recovery from exercise that's as important as the exercise itself, I think. For sure, yeah. And, and obviously that's more important with a high-intensity workout than it is a, um, a, a lower-intensity right. brisk walk. Mm-hmm. But I think a brisk walk is probably one of the best things that any of us can do. It's good for arthritis. It's good for joint cartilage. Um, it doesn't break down <laughs> joints. It doesn't cause arthritis. matter of fact, it heals it, mm. uh, which I think is one of the myths about osteoarthritis, that yeah. it is wear and tear. It's yeah. not. Um, so I think that's that's probably one of the things, and I think the combination of a Mediterranean diet and a routine uh, exercise program is a very powerful tool. Um, I do recommend s- supplements. Uh, to me, if someone can take a turmeric supplement rather than taking a chronic NSAID, mm. I think that's a better way to go for almost uh, for for most people. Uh, it's going to protect their stomachs and likely not be toxic to kidneys as much. So I think that's oh, yeah. a good thing. Um, I'm a big believer in a omega three supplementation as mm-hmm. well for nerve health. Yeah, um, those those omega three fatty acids are broken down into things called resolvins and protectants that are powerful inflammation resolvers, mm. especially for nerve injury and nerve pain. That's great. And your body will make them. Yeah. So. We actually recommend that too, um, as far as um, people often ask us, well, what can I do now to enhance my health right now? And among the things, omega-3 has always comes up as one of our top supplements. And also, um, believe it or not, uh, using things like creatine, um, which has been studied for decades and decades, um, for not only brain health now, as we found out in the research, but also just for being able to even sustain muscle growth, even as we get older. One of the things that is very helpful is that, and it's relatively innocuous from my understanding. Yeah, I think I've seen more and more about the use of creatine. I think I've seen more uh, the creatine literature in performance, yeah. especially in 
uh, in power, yes. power performance and sprinting and, and weight training mm -hmm. uh, because it is that immediate source of fuel. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, it, it bypasses the mitochondria and then gives that quick uh, fuel. I always think of glucose as first fuel. Yes. You know, break down, gl break down glucose and second is creatine and third is mitochondria. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's a, you know, potential advantage, especially in someone who's trying to compete. Yeah, for sure. There's also a big movement now in the endurance world. Uh, we had our guest, um, Chris Newport, who came on, and uh, she's a dietitian and also an exercise physiologist. And the literature is really supportive of even endurance athletes taking creatine just to help retain for, for, for performance as well, but also to help retain even muscular adaptations as well. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I might have, I might have aware of that literature. And most of the thing, most of the things I think about too are ways to keep mitochondria healthy. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we study neuropathies and nerve injuries, mo one of the common pathways of a lot of neuropathies is just energy failure of a nerve. Huh. And and that's why you know when people get neuropathies, they feel it first in their feet. That's the longest nerve in the body, is the yeah. you know, sciatic nerve, and yeah. it's the first to feel the strain of any metabolic disease or viral infection or um, um, or you know, other insults such as chemotherapy. And and a lot of that is an energy failure. So mitochondria is critical for that, and it's critical oh. for endurance too. So yeah. obviously for 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 muscle health, and that's what keeps us keeps us moving. For sure, yeah. Can we talk more about nerve injury? Tell me more about. Um, the things that you did to um, help clients with peripheral nerve injuries? I, I always think of um, two aspects of nerve injury. One is, is, is there a pain part that's preventing them from doing what they want to do? And two is, is there a function part trying to feed? I think of it as feeding the nerve as best we can. Mm -hmm. And if you, for instance, if I ultrasound someone with carpal tunnel, uh, they'll, have, they'll have nerve swelling right mm -hmm. before it goes to the tunnel. And that, to me, is a sign of essentially lack of nutritive flow to the distal parts to the ends of the nerve. Uh, it's just a, almost a physical obstruction. That same obstruction happens in, in sciatica, someone with a spine compression. Mm -hmm. uh, but the nerve has just essentially a, a, a nutritive flow problem. So that's, that's the other part. So one is, is dealing with the pain and perhaps some hyperactivity of the nerve to calm that down. And two is to, to feed it and get it uh, get the, the nutritive flow to the ends of the nerve as best we can. Sometimes that's mechanical. Mm -hmm. If someone has scar tissue in the area, if you can tease out that scar, either I do a lot of hydrodissections where we'll yeah. inject around the nerve to open up the scar and tease yeah. it away from that. We can do that in the spine. We can do that for peripheral nerves as well. Mm -hmm. Um, some of that are, are supplements and, and you know, nutrition, uh, which is important. And some of that is just, frankly, exercise hmm. and, and flow, and that's one of the more powerful um, tools that we have. Oh, um, and also for, for, you know, getting back to mitochondrial function, yeah. you know, their uh, heavy saturated fat diets uh, are not good for mitochondrial function. Olive oils and those kind of oils are, are very good. So those are, those are fairly powerful interventions. Monosaturated, that's really cool. What are the uh, kinds of serious injuries that you've had to deal with for uh, different clients of yours coming in with nerve injuries? Well, quite a few. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we, we've done some research on amputation injury and some uh, of the neuromas with that. And one of the things we learned in working with some of the traumatic um, traumatic nerve injuries we've seen, and people talk, you know, we did some work on phantom, phantom injury, yeah. um, is that actually most individuals who experience a traumatic injury that leaves them with a phantom, a lot of times they have a peripheral nerve that's also uh, a little bit hyperactive, a little bit hypersensitive. Mm. And if you can get the peripheral nerve to calm down, get that neuroma to quiet down, a lot of times the phantom calms down too. So that's one of the things that we did see mm. when we were researching nerve injury. So back to the back to the kind of the calming down of a nerve and how to, how to do that. Yeah. Again, back to the, 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 the theory that make sure it's not tethered or obstructed or being tugged on or tethered. Um, that, that's an important thing and, and making sure it's as healthy as it can be. And even sometimes uh, neuralizing those nerves and that's, oh. you know, to taking it and, and removing that, that envelope that's sensitized can be a tool as well. Right. Would that be like an ablation? Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Same thing we do for Morton's aroma or something like that. Exactly. And and I'm I'm not as big of a fan of ablations as I used to be. I still do them for spine issues and other things. Um, but I always think of it that as a way when we can't uh, retrain someone from, you know, for instance, for, for back pain issues and facet issues, mm -hmm. the first, second, third thing to me is all still is multifidus strength and how yes. do you train sure. multifidi and, and, and if you can engage them, people tend to do better. Absolutely. But, but can you, you know, it's, that's the first step is hard. 
Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned multifidae. You're actually the first physician I've met who've mentioned multifidae as, as, a, <laughs> as, as a staple. It's, it's probably the first thing we do with anyone coming in, whether it's a shoulder injury, knee injury, whatever, is uh, assessing how well they can actually engage the muscles to stabilize their spine. Because if they're not even able to do that and gain pelvic control, anything above or below is going to suffer at some point. And so just by doing some corrective movements, uh, we have found that that can actually help people along the process even faster getting back to things they want to do, whether it's an extremity or a central little back issue. That's interesting that you even look at that for shoulder as well. Oh, yeah. So all the time, it yeah. make, makes a bit of, makes a bit of sense because the shoulder is such a strange joint to begin it, with, oh, right? Absolutely, <laughs> inherently stable, so we can throw objects. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, as far as athletes, um, have you had to use uh, a lot of your therapies for different athletes, different levels? We, we do. We do see some athletes. Uh, you know, probably the one of the better tools is is at the autologous condition serum program. For I think that's probably one of the better tools for athletes. Oh. Um, it, it seems to do some things that the other therapies don't do, uh, which is nice. And I think probably gets back people, folks back to field pitch or court a oh. little bit, a little bit faster. Interesting. So that's probably the most, you know, because if professional athletes yeah. who come in have a very well thought out regimen of, you know, physical therapy, training, nutrition and everything else. Yeah. And so usually they're, they're really tuned up from that perspective. They just need something to, to help out. Mm. Is there a sort of a range of how often someone needs to get any of these orthobiologics? There are, uh, there's, there's not a range. It, it's, I think it's, it's, um, I see some folks who come in almost annually mm. for it. You know, there's been some debate, uh, looking at even a plate luge plaza. Some people do a series of two of them right off the bat. Yeah. I always like to see response from anything that we do at least some response and you may not get a complete response and it in that respect it might be worth repeating but there should be some response i think to anything we do if it's in the right setting yeah. and uh i'm not a big fan of, of folks who who say we well, had to do a series of three right off the bat yeah. i i uh, it's always i feel like it's always good to reassess and see where you are i like so. that uh I, I think one of the things that we try to do differently is every session somebody comes in, we always want to reassess to make sure that even what we did last session was even helpful. Exactly. And then we just kind of go from there uh, in a similar, similar kind of way. Right, right. And that's one of the things, you know, it's that you find that sweet spot, right? I, go, yeah. I call it the Goldilocks position oh, for like for uh, anything. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was, you know, I, and back to, uh, I think that uh, what the work that you do and, 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 and physical therapists do is, is just so important for any rehab. Matter of fact, I was, um, um, working on a book right now and uh the chapter i was working on over the weekend one of the statements i think i said in there was a, a good physical therapist is worth their weight in gold and i think that i think that's true yeah i think that really is true so tom in your experience i'm so glad you brought that up um i'm glad we made your book as a profession <laughs> but um as far as physical therapists go what have you found to be the important characteristics of helping someone find the right physical therapist I like when they see therapists, uh, when patients see therapists who are hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, I think anybody can be given a, an exercise bicycle and told to go exercise on it, but you can sure. do that at home. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big believer in someone who's really going to look at mechanics of movement and very, be very hands-on, whether it's either manual therapies or, or at least a very, a very close kinetic look and kinetic chain look. That's awesome. Um, do you find that also uh, it helps for the clients that you uh, recommend a therapy for that uh, the therapist also has um, either maybe perform does the sport that the person is talking about or well that's certainly right because yeah. I mean, if if that person does the sport yeah. it, it, they are truly an expert in it right they, yeah, exactly. they can dive down to those details very very deeply yeah that, that's always a nice thing yeah. yes. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, Tom, tell us, tell our audience about the things that you do to kind of keep yourself um, healthy. You and I are not getting any younger, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately. But it beats the alternative. It, it absolutely <laughs> does. Uh, do you find, uh, what are the things that you do to kind of keep yourself healthy? Because uh, you look like you're pretty fit. Well, I, I, I try to be. Uh, you know, like we were talking, uh, I think, before we yeah. uh, started the podcast that I'm a, I'm a, I enjoy biking a lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I bike, swim, and I play a, a bevy of other sports as well, um, and try to get a decent diet as well. And yeah. um, I, I'm probably not not quite as good at sleep as I should be. I, oh, I'm no. increasingly aware of <laughs> of those issues, yeah. you know. And there's some very strong literature of of brain health and sleep. Oh, yeah. um, 
for sure. But I think, you know, again, the, the core of diet and exercise, I think, is really critical. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I would say that as I've matured uh, as a person and also as a physical therapist, um, I have found that the things that I try to do for myself, I now am passing on to my clients as well. Well, it's easier um, when you can talk from experience, too, oh, yeah. right? I remember, you know, starting out 20, 20 25 years ago. Yeah. It's hard to speak with a a 60-year-old from a place of experience, right? You haven't had that. I can speak from that place of experience more (laughs) now, and and perhaps that helps out. And I can speak from a place of empathy as well for for those who have suffered various uh, sports injuries or other ailments. (laughs) (laughs) Similar, yeah. And for me, it's funny, and I think you're in the same way. Um, Like, I just want to be able to be as active as I can for the next, God willing, 30, 40 years and to be the best I can be during that time period and not have any kinds of things hold me back. And I find that once I uh, talk to clients in that manner who are also in their 40s and 50s, we also create sort of like that connection where it's like, wow, you know, he really gets me because, you know, I'm not looking to kill it like I used to and, and race as hard as I used to. I just want to be able to last now. Right, right. I'm, I'm in the same, the same way. Yeah. Don't need to come in first in whatever race it is. I just want to finish and I'd like to be able to <laughs> be able to do that, that competition or, or um, that athletic uh, activity in 10, 20, 25 years. Exactly. From now. Yeah, that's great. Tell us more about your book. Uh, so it's... Um, I have had an interest in trying to explain this world of regenerative therapies in a way that patients can really understand uh, for a while. There's a lot out there that's written, but I feel like um, um, there are a lot of misconceptions as well about what these therapies do and don't do. And Mm. patients come in and they have really, really good questions. Um, Um, what does what does what does a stem cell do? What does a PRP do? What what does ACS do? Mm-hmm. And it's a hard conversation to have within the context of a 20, 30, 40 minute visit. Yeah. Um, and it really takes a deeper dive. And so about four ish years ago, I started kind of doing the pre work for this book. And um, I have a contract now with uh, Bull Publishing out of Colorado. They yeah. do a lot of health oriented titles. Oh, and cool. And so we're going to finish the book. Um, mm. I'm, uh, it's going to be about 12 chapters. They're going to go from the basics of explaining arthritis, uh, explaining neuropathies, and then diving into what do we do, how do we understand them, and then what do we do to help them to improve or heal, yeah. uh, both from all these various perspectives we've been talking about, whether it's a, a diet exercise or a regenerative therapy. And I kind of look at it that way. Mm. I look at... Um, our own internal ways of, of healing. And to me, you know, what we call regenerative therapies, which really almost could be called restorative therapies is mm-hmm. almost a better way. I'd like to think yeah. of it because we're not, we're not replacing cells. We're encouraging your own cells to work better. And yeah. it's almost a reprogramming and reinstruction of, of, of cells and tissues and cartilage and nerves. Right. Um, but I wanted to explain it in a way that was uh, very as straightforward as possible and understandable and that removed some of the fiction around these therapies and some of the misconceptions. Hmm. What do you think the biggest misconceptions are for some of these therapies? Some of the, so I think one of them is the causes of osteoarthritis. Mm. Again, the fact that it is it's not wear and tear. Now, if you're running ultra marath, a lot of ultra marathons, you're probably not recovering enough mm-hmm. to, um, uh, to sustain that. Yeah. But Normal exercise, again, back to a brisk walk or a light jog or a good bike ride, a good hard bike ride, uh, is a very therapeutic anabolic process. I think that's the first one. The second one is stem cells. The way we use them in the United States don't work by by sticking to and growing new cartilage when you inject them into a knee. Mm. Um, they are immune stimulants, and so explaining what they do and what they don't do. Yeah. Um, and then also doing a deeper dive into mechanisms. Like, like we had done the, some of the research on autologous condition serum and how it works and and yeah. and some of the immune aspects of that some of the exosome aspects of that mm-hmm. um, i i think there's going to be a really interesting science that develops over the next 10 years not on cell therapies but on uh, what i would call secretome therapies so things that our cells secrete huh. and i think exosomes will be part of that there it's it these are tiny tiny particles that are really cellular instruction manuals that Hmm. cells share. Nerves share them, immune cells share them. They can be 
really effective. They can also be not effective, and it's almost like a, it's almost like a piece of sheet music. If it's yeah. written well, it can be a really wonderful thing, but if it's not written well, it may not be helpful <sighs> at all. And and the question is how do you, how do you hone that instruction manual? How do you hone those yeah. um, a, a immune and cellular communication packets as best you can? Mm -hmm. So then, like surrounding arthritis in particular. Um, and a lot of people get down about that, like, oh, you know, they, they get an x-ray done, hey, found out I have arthritis, you know, doom and gloom. Is there any way that you can actually encourage them to not look at that as necessarily like a, you know, a sort of a downward spiral? Well, y yes, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, uh, half the people walking around with radiographic arthritis don't even know it. Um, I just said that. And so the... The diagnostic criteria for arthritis was established in the 1950s, and it hasn't changed since. And, wow. and so our concept, and that's where our concept of, of I, I think, some of the, the wear and tear concept came from, mm -hmm. which was, again, fine for the 1950s and 60s, but I think it's time to move on. Oh, yeah. To me, our, our arthritis is a, it's a, it's a biochemical problem, and it's a whole joint problem. Mm -hmm. um, what is in the joint fluid of a synovial joint? Um, is that an anabolic uh, environment, or is it a catabolic environment that's breaking down tissues? And how do you find that balance? And how do you rebalance that? Right. Um, and so that's to me, uh, osteoarthritis is is a balance issue within the joint, and it's really more of a anabolic, catabolic, and biochemical balance rather than just a, a wearing of cartilage. The cartilage that the arthritis of seeing X ray is the result of arthritis. It's not the cause of it. It's the mm. result of it. And, Glad you made that distinction. And so, you know, I think if we reconceptualize that, um, uh, it's really very possible to to make a lot of progress with that, even if you don't have as much cartilage as as, as we all did when we were twenties or thirties. Right. You know? <laughs> and it's funny on the same vein. Um, there are many people with degenerative meniscus tears, and don't even realize that they have meniscus tears either. Uh, that's a great example. It's mm -hmm. a great example. You know, and if you, if you look at rotator cuff tendinopathy, yeah. so. Um, there was a study, it was a few years ago, but they MRI'd 100 people walking down the street who had no shoulder pain, and I think 50% of those over 60 had a rotator cuff there they just didn't know about. Interesting. So, you know, and if you think about, you know, I ultrasound people all day with rotator cuff yeah. issues, they, the pain, I think, a lot of times comes from the bursitis that's the under, with, so the tendon, it's not necessarily tendonitis, but a tendinopathy, so the tendon is unhealthy. Yeah. And it drives inflammation of the burst on top, and that's what people feel is pain. So if yeah. you can get them to calm down and get them to go back and work on their band exercises and some of the strengthening exercises, back to that Goldilocks position of, mm -hmm. of strain, which is good, then they can heal the tendon and it doesn't come back. Um, same thing with, with hips and, you know, hip trochanters. Um, it's the same thing as the tendon. You know, you, you know this quite well, right? Yeah, there's there's the tendon of structure that yeah. we're all trying to work on, whether it's glute mid, glute min, and all those surrounding tendons. But yeah. it's the bursts over top that gives people fits. Yeah. And actually, that's one of the one of the beauties of the past um, 10, 15 years is the use of ultrasound for some of these procedures, too, because yeah. you can really target. You know, I did these, I mean, I did these procedures for years before ultrasound was out. And in retrospect, we were doing a lot of steroid injections directly into tendons, mm. which we now know is not a good idea, yeah. but we we didn't know what we didn't know in, right, the, in the 90s and the 2000s. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now we do. But now we can also do these very low-dose discrete injections into very very small areas. Right. And we can keep steroid around away from tendons. And that way we can decrease the inflammation. Uh, of the bursa, mm -hmm. they can get symptomatic relief. They can do their exercise and get the tendons to heal. And that's very much my approach to it. Oh, I love that. Is, and, um, but again, the healing is about the healing is about the, the eccentrics and the bands and all those kind of exercises I think people are doing. Yeah, for doing. sure. So definitely working in tandem with the rehab, these things can actually be very beneficial. Absolutely. Do you, um, what are your thoughts on cortisone? It sounds like sort of a pros and cons to it. Um, I've heard mixed stories and I know that there's certain, for sure, Tendons are not the areas you want to inject like we used to, but what are your thoughts on cortisone and how it can help people? I think a, uh, a single steroid injection can be a very helpful thing if it helps someone to mobilize mm -hmm. from an injury that they can't mobilize from. Um, repeated steroid injections, I think, are the ones to avoid. Yeah. And, and that was studied and, uh, fairly definitively a couple years ago in a trial that looked at steroid injections versus saline injections into individuals with knee arthritis. Mm. 
And what they found is not surprisingly, the folks had steroid injections got, you know, acute relief. Mm -hmm. But at the end of two years, um, there was no difference between the groups, huh. not a surprise, so no long-term change. But the ones who had repeated steroid injections had less cartilage in their knees by MRI. Oh, wow. So, again, it, you're throwing off, that, I was talking about that balance, that yeah. anabolic, catabolic balance inside the joint. You're throwing that off, I think, with repeated injections. So I'm a big believer if someone is not able to engage in, in that kind of rehabilitation program, uh, a, a steroid injection can be very helpful for that, mm -hmm. especially if it's targeted and away from tendons and other structures that don't like the right. C-steroids. Uh, but it's the repeated use I get concerned about. And that also d includes even bone health and some right. of the other things we get concerned about. For sure. I remember uh, years ago, and maybe I don't know if it's still true, that the particularly the one tendon that you don't want to use cortisone on is the Achilles. Is that still true? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, I think so. Well, it's such a catastrophic injury <laughs> when it occurs, right? Oh. And yeah, I think the same thing goes for the biceps long head of the biceps mm -hmm. tendon. Yeah. Um, but that's a less catastrophic injury. I think there's been plenty of people who have lost the long head of the biceps and can still function yeah, right off the short yeah. head. Yeah. But Achilles is such a devastating issue. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Yes. What are your thoughts on um, injecting for the plantar fascia? I've, I've heard similar things with Achilles, but... I'm not sure where you stand on that. Yes, um, so I, I'm a I, I'm a bigger believer in things like uh, the biologics yeah. rather than I am steroid. Yeah. Um, you know, not just with the fascia, but also you can see some fat atrophy mm. in the area, and yeah. if you lose fat cushion, oh. that's not an ideal thing too. No, so I'm not a big not. fan of the steroid injections. I got to think if it's one time. I'm actually I think shockwave. I don't personally do shockwave, yeah. but I've heard very good things about it for plantar fascia. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so, we actually use it all the time. In fact. Yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of ultra runners, uh, we have a lot of ultra runners who have acquired plantar fascia. Not a surprise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. Um, one of my guys this morning, uh, we were working and he's, he's had this for almost two years and he's probably 95% better right now after a couple of sessions of the shockwave. But what really sh uh, shocked, shocked him was that, um, no it, pun intended, yeah, no pun intended. Uh, it really wasn't the, the, the root cause of his issue was actually coming from the way he was running. And so oftentimes I tell runners coming in, hey, before I do anything with any of the devices that we have, let's look at how you run because if you're the kind of person who um, is a stomper and maybe it's because you're a heel striker, any of these number of things can really contribute to why you're having this in the first place. So I can, like I said before, I can shockwave your foot, but if we're not drilling, drilling down on how you're running, you're not going to get better. I, I think that's really important. Matter of fact, I wish someone had looked at my uh, my running gait years oh, ago. Yeah. I think I, I ran with an, uh, a too long of a stride mm. length for probably 35 years, oh, which yeah. probably was not, I don't think it was a very good, a very good idea, but <laughs> you know, you don't know, again, you, you don't, don't know, know what you don't, you don't know. know. Exactly. So, but if I had to go back in time, I would have had somebody put me on a treadmill and film me and, and, and correct my uh, stride length then. Yeah. So. It's funny that when uh, runners come in, uh, the first question I ask them is, um, well, who taught you how to run? And it's always that blank stare. Well, nobody. Nobody. I exactly. Just... That's the problem. <laughs> so I said, well, this is our opportunity now to get some principles down so that you have a better shot of running with less pain. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, again, it's, it's, it's mechanics and it's important. You know, we can get we can get by with a lot of things when we're 15, 20, and 30 yeah. years old. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 55 now, so I can I feel those things a little more than I used to. So. <laughs> yeah. 48, so I'm just behind you right now, but I'm also feeling those things too. What I noticed too, actually, Tom, is that, you know, back in my 20s and 30s, and maybe even my late 30s, I never had to really warm up for anything. But now, if I'm going to do a heavy lift, especially if I'm going to do a group fitness class, I need like a good 15, 20 minutes to get myself going before I can even touch a weight or do anything that the class is requiring me to do. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I think it's, I do, I do the same thing now. The challenge is, is your time, you know, I'm trying to, you're trying to find those, know, those moments time. and, uh, realize the workouts take a little longer than it used to, Absolutely. but it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Probably a real good idea. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So some final thoughts. Um, one of the questions I ask, often ask my guests is what is your, your go-to like junk food? Like this is like your uh, guilty pleasure of all pleasures. Chocolate chip cookie. Oh yeah. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Pretty much anything with chocolate. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, Great. and and I, I have a little bit of weakness for a little bit of weakness for uh, dessert uh, ah, sweet at night. Know. I know it's not the great. That's not my greatest habit, but uh, <laughs> but it is certainly nice when you're sitting there trying to work on uh, emails, papers, or something else, that's, and uh, yeah. you know, 
Yeah, it goes Absolutely. down well. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Tom, thank you so much for being on our show. And uh, I know I learned a lot about how we can best utilize these regenerative therapies uh, for our clients who've been suffering with chronic injuries or injuries that just have not been getting better for any number of reasons. So thank you for sharing your knowledge on our show. My pleasure, Jerry. Thank you for having me. Yep. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode. It really does mean a lot to us. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, or comment if you got at least one or two helpful insights or takeaways to help you get to your next level.